use of everybody's time. Uh, so I see more folks coming in, but I think we should get started. So welcome everyone to our first Friday forum today. Um, we are very happy to have Dr. Daniel Wuba from Millersville University and Dr. Barbara Altman from Franklin and Marshall with us. Uh, this is going to be a great discussion on higher education uh, during the time of coronavirus. So this is something that uh, we've we've obviously been following very closely, and and I know uh, most of you have as well. This is uh, a topic that um, it has a lot of implications for uh, how we move forward here in Lancaster County. Um, so before we get started, I want to thank our sponsors, Rogers and Associates. They've been uh, with us for First Fridays uh, for a while here, and we very much appreciate their sponsorship. Um, and Millersville University. And while we're not at the Ware Center, <laughs> we can see from Dr. Wuba's background uh, that he uh, is representing us from there. So <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and then just a little background on, on the format that we'll take here. So um, we've got uh, 20 minutes allocated for each of um, our guests to do a presentation. We're going to start with Dr. Wuba, um, and then uh, we'll have a question and answer session uh, for both of them. So questions can be submitted on the bottom of your screen under the Q&A function. Um, each question uh, can be submitted and you all will be able to see it and vote on the questions. So the, the questions that receive the most votes are the ones that we'll start with. Um, and then work our way from there. So uh, these questions can be for both Dr. Ruba and Dr. Altman. So thank you very much. And without further delay, I will uh, let Dr. Ruba start us off. Okay. Well, thank you very much, um, Jonathan. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I would um, share my screen uh, that I'm going to that to show the PowerPoint that I'll be using. So um, let me try putting it up there. Okay, I think. Can everyone see it? Okay, well, um, thank you once again for joining us. Um, as you are all aware, this pandemic has really impacted every aspect of everything that we do. So um, these few slides are to share with you how Millersville has reacted to uh, the pandemic and what our plans currently are for the uh, fall. But I have to preface it by saying all plans that we are doing are currently in flux because of the uncertainty of the situations that we currently face. So what happened was when we first heard about the pandemic coming to the US as, mid, as early as mid-February, we started bringing back our students who were um, doing it study abroad. While doing that, we also started planning about transitioning our entire instructions from face-to-face to the remote environment. And within two weeks in March, we were able to transfer um, that's most uh, all of our classes to online mode. At that time, we allowed only essential employees who need to perform life-sustaining functions to be on campus. And we also started plans to prorate student charges and so that we can issue them housing and dining refunds because we were right around our spring break. So we still had uh, students who under normal conditions would have been here for the second half of the semester. Just at that time, we also um, established an EPIC Student Compassion Fund. EPIC is um, the acronym for our values. So we use it in everything that we do. And uh, I'm glad to say that and since we established that fund, we've been able to raise more than $440,000 uh, that have been used specifically to help our students in any kind of uh, pandemic-related needs that they have. Within um, the first, first four weeks of establishing our coronavirus website uh, to share information and provide information to um, those who needed any kind of assistance, both students, parents, and faculty, we had over 70,000 views in that short time. Now, what were the experiences of our students and employees during that time? The shift to uh, that remote teaching, learning, and working, as you can imagine, was very uh, massive. It had an impact on the entire campus, but I'm glad to say that our community reacted very positively, and we were able to get a lot done in that short period. For example, we were able to uh, transfer 716 courses to online. 
At that time, only 17% of our classes were online. But within two weeks, we had our entire um, course, course uh, system online. So we had 100% of our courses online within two weeks. We had to allow some students to stay on campus, especially the international students and those who were shelter insecure um, to stay on campus. And we gave them special um, support at that time. Um, in March, we recorded 6,500 Zoom meetings you know, during those, the second half of March as a result of the shift. And our IT Hub just handled over 1,400 new requests during that time. Around the same time, we also had to plan about how to get students out of the residence halls and as and student affairs staff as well as uh, facility staff work collaboratively to get uh, students uh, back home safely in that time. Um, then came the issue of um, commencement. Uh, we decided that based on the survey of the students that we will postpone commencement to a time when conditions will allow us to get together. So uh, of about 1,300 graduating students, they've all uh, agreed that we would have a commencement and that's after and conditions improve that will allow us to get together. Now, one will say, what is happening with regards to our plans for the fall? We are currently, we've chosen a, a hybrid modality approach. And this came after we looked at several um, different scenarios. We started with 15 different scenarios. We narrowed it down to three. And after we worked with our incidents response team, as well as our innovation task force that was focusing on fall opening, we decided to go with the hybrid modal modality. In this case, we'll have a combination of in-person as well as online and multimodal instruction. Most of our first year student uh, courses will be delivered face-to-face, -face, as well as courses that require experiential or hands-on um, opportunities. We'll make sure that we'll deliver those to them in the labs or the studios. With regards to our academic calendar, classes will start on August 24th and run straight through November 20th on campus. There will be no fall break, and there will be classes on Labor Day. The, and the purpose for doing that is to prevent students going back and forth and to decrease or mitigate the chances of um, any student and bringing back um, that's a, a positive case to campus. When students leave uh, during Thanksgiving break, um, they will not come back to campus, but they will resume classes on November 30th online, as well as their final exams. So we are going to encourage students, um, even during the weekends, for them to stay on campus as much as possible. What about our faculty and staff and um, students with regards to safety measures? That has been the primary concern in most of all the decisions that we've made. So for example, with, with regards to our classes, We've, and we are modifying our classroom seating to minimize pathogen transmission. We are upgrading uh, the classroom technology to support the, this multimodal course that uh, we are talking about so that it will allow students who are in the classroom and um, provide enough space between them in terms of social distancing, but at the same time also allow students who want to take the classes remotely to be able to do so. As at now, we anticipate that more than 50% of our courses are going to be delivered fully online. We are working with our faculty members to de determine which courses will be fully online and those that will require experiential uh, opportunities for our students. As I mentioned, safety and health um, is primary to every decision that we are making. So across campus itself, uh, for example, at the moment, when our staff come to campus, they have to go through our health center to get their temperature taken and also make sure that they don't have any indications of early signs of the disease. We are modifying campus spaces to encourage social distancing. For example, we are going to put out tents you know, in open spaces and have limited number of seating in those areas so that if um, students want to be outside you know, in the fall to enjoy the fall, they will be able to do so. Cleaning and disinfecting and sanitation efforts have increased and across campus to meet the CDC guidelines. And we require the use of masks for everybody who comes to campus. We encourage students um, that for the fall to, to live in what would be equivalent to family units. So in the suite, if there are four students, they will be responsible for each other. 
because we will require them to understand that if one person comes down positive with the case, it will impact the entire suite. So students will have to step up and be more responsible to each other. In terms of the dining, we're going to provide grab and go dining. And in this case, um, students would not um, be taking part in any kind of buffet meals. And that will be um, not available to any student. And we are even thinking about the potential of um, providing students time to uh, set up to come in and uh, to come and grab their food. Uh, out of state and international students, uh, we are currently thinking about how to get them in. Uh, for out of state students, um, we, they'll be using the hybrid instruction approach in the same way that our in state students will be using. So it's available to all our students. And um, this is primarily because um, most of our neighboring states have um, case trends that are similar to that of ours. With regards to international students, currently we are not anticipating a lot of that's any new international students, primarily because most of the embassies are closed and because of travel restrictions. So we don't I think we will get any students coming in. But our continuing international students who stayed in the US will be back on campus this fall. What about athletics? Uh, intercollegiate athletics is one, uh, Melesville is part of the PSAC, and we've been working with our commissioner since uh, March to figure out what we'll be doing in the fall. At a recent meeting, uh, President voiced our concern about contact sports. And as a result of that, you know, we all talked about the fact that our athletes are student first. So if there's any kind of contact sports, we have to consider carefully the impact of you know, social distancing you know, uh, that we have in class and then what would happen on the field. Um, as I speak now, um, at our most recent meeting, we decided that on July 14th, there will be a, a vote by the board that's made up of the presidents. There are 18 universities. So we will vote uh, to decide the kind of um, athletic uh, events that will take place in the fall. But um, based on where we are now, it's likely that we will not have um, any kind of sporting athletic uh, competitive events that would be uh, based, that would be contact sports. How have we handled recruitment and retention? We focused on providing unique student experiences while navigating this disruption by the COVID, you know, by the pandemic. So um, admissions has been conducting virtual open house events, you know, since uh, I think April or so. And this past Wednesday, we started that uh, group campus tours for our students. In addition to that, for our students who live in Lancaster, uh, recently we held what we call the Morada Mayhem Parade, which was basically, we had a number of uh, Millersville vehicles that went around the entire county. And for any student who had been admitted and has signed up to come to Millersville, we stopped by their house and we put a sign in, their, in front of their house that you know, we are looking forward to them coming to Millersville. We are trying to connect our freshmen before they arrive. We are also keeping in touch with our continued students through various Zoom events and, and using Microsoft Teams. So we are encouraging the student organizations to keep in touch with each other through uh, that virtual communications. And that's to keep them engaged. In addition to that, to promote flexibility, access, and transparency, we've made things very clear to our incoming students. For example, our SAT currently is optional, and we are accepting unofficial transcripts from students. Also, um, to allow these students to really get a feel for what they would um, experience in the fall, we are using student testimonials for them to picture themselves on our campus. We are integrating videos into our virtual open houses, and we are pairing student tour guides with incoming students through these Zoom tours and interactive chats uh, for most of them before they even arrive on our campus. We're also utilizing testimonials of recent alumni to promote the value of a Millersville University degree during this financial hardship. And finally, um, we've increased our scholarship dollars as a way to help students who would need additional resources to be able to attend Millersville University. Um, the other challenge that one can think about as a result of the pandemic is the fact that it will have an impact on our total enrollment. Interestingly, for this summer, and this is nationwide, we've seen an increase, an uptick in the number of students who are taking classes over the summer. And one of the reasons we paid is because most students are not able to get summer jobs, so they are using the time taking classes this um, summer. 
with regards to our trends in, uh, for fall enrollment, uh, for the uh, currently we are projecting a 1.5 to 2 percent decline relative to last year, but we hope we can make that up since our melt has been lower than previous years. So all things being equal, if we get the same, if we are level and we don't lose any students, our overall numbers are similar to the fall of last year, we would um, take it as a positive outcome. We are also tracking transfer students, graduates and graduate students who currently may not have committed because they may be waiting for jobs. And we feel that if the job outlook is not strong in the fall, some of them may choose to uh, enroll in uh, our classes. We are also, um, as a result of uh, the pandemic, we are aligning our academic program offerings with workforce needs that we are encouraging students to take classes that would help them uh, secure jobs within a short time, or that basically take classes that would take them into uh, jobs that will be waiting. And with that, we've established an Office of Community Engagement, Governmental and Economic Development, which opened um, this past Wednesday. So we have that office um, functioning now with an executive director and staff members. So what is the long-term implications of the pandemic? And I'll break this down into uh, three main areas. One is on the student academic challenge and then the institutional level, as well as the you know, higher ed landscape as a whole. In terms of um, that's looking at long-term higher ed impacts, affordability and accessibility is going to be a challenge. Also, um, there's going to be an increase in the rate at which digital technologies will have to be integrated into uh, the curriculum to give students this transformative uh, experiences that we want to see happen. Also, uh, we'll have to think about meeting the educational needs of non-traditional students because of the job market. In addition to that, um, it's likely that there are several challenges that higher education currently face that would actually be exacerbated. For example, there are a number of institutions that are not in financially good positions, and some of them you know, um, are most likely going to go over the cliff. So um, it's going to have impacts you know, that um, in certain cases we can't even imagine. But at Millersville at the moment, the senior leadership working with our board We've taken the attitude that within every crisis, there's an opportunity. So we keep looking for you know, opportunities to actually enhance our own operations you know, during this time of crisis. In a, so let's look at some of the challenges that students will face. Most students are going to have problems with you know, their finances during this, um, that's this pandemic because of the recession that we currently face. Also, students and parents are wondering about you know, the quality of um, ex that's the experiences in the remote environment versus face-to-face -face instruction. So that's something that students are going to try to figure out from themselves. The most students coming, the traditional students coming to Millersville are interested in the residential campus experience. And at the moment, it's going to be modified because of the pandemic. We are also keeping an eye on the mental well-being of our students. So these are our challenges that we'll be facing. In, with regards to the opportunities, as I said earlier, this the implementation of our digital technologies is going to really be accelerated uh, as a result of our current situation. And also, students are going to uh, be able to um, get some flexibility when it comes to taking classes online. And our faculty, we believe, would hone their experiences to give these students better experience. And finally, uh, we are creating uh, basically uh, this communities that uh, will be uh, working together uh, in the digital spaces, but we have to provide them the support. And this is something that we believe will be developing more of under these conditions. The economic challenges that we currently see happening on the horizon is the fact that you know, we have to be able to balance the integration of our digital technologies into the classroom with the rigor of the experiences that the students will get, that we, we don't have to sacrifice one for the other. And in addition to that, and we have to work hard to make sure that you know, there will be acceptance you know, and then also the scaling of these innovative uh, approaches that we're going to use. The opportunities that we see happening at the moment uh, under the uh, long-term implications uh, across the campus in terms of academics is we have a chance to pilot several multimodal instructional approaches and also to come up with alternative academic calendars such as we are doing this fall. We're also going to uh, assess the demand for badges, certificates, and credentials, because for most uh, non-traditional students who have to go back to the workforce, they need short-term certificates or training 
to be able to go back. And that's why our uh, Center for the Community Engagement, Governmental and uh, Economic Development is going to uh, provide us uh, that opportunities to do that, to work with the local community and uh, the local industries to develop you know, these um, badges and certificates and credentials. What about institutionally? Um, the challenges definitely include enrollment and potentially you know, and declines in state funding because you know, our appropriations are based on enrollment. Also, uh, we are already incurring uh, additional costs, you know, such as refitting our dining or refitting the residence halls with plexiglass, you know, providing and that's, and that's a disinfectant, the extra cleaning. Those are all additional costs as a result of the pandemic. And the other um, that's in no course challenge that we face that at the moment hasn't really shown up is we've seen a number of our uh, senior and uh, that's uh, employees really considering retirement at this time for various reasons. And we are really um, trying to find ways not to lose institutional knowledge as a result of these early retirements for those who may have st stuck around. There are opportunities here. This include, and uh, that's the broader support for adopting these new technologies. Previously, there were some faculty members who were not necessarily uh, supportive of it, but now they don't have a choice. And for most of them, after teaching online this past spring, they've gained better understanding and appreciation and actually support for using uh, these new modalities. Also, uh, as an institution, we've gained um, more confidence in our ability to be agile to these changing circumstances. And finally, in terms of opportunities that we see on the, and that, on the horizon, and this new office that we've established, we believe would enable us to engage with our local uh, community as well as the whole South Central in Pennsylvania. So um, in conclusion, the question is, what does the future of online education look like, you know, not only at Millersville, but nationally? I think, you know, the pandemic, as I've said, has accelerated a transition to online education, you know, um, at a way that um, we never expected. Um, I mentioned earlier that before the pandemic started, 17% of our courses were online. But within two weeks, we were able to flip and put 100% of our courses online. And for this fall, um, we are already aware that more than 50% of our classes will be delivered strictly online. So that is an impact that, you know, uh, when you look at the future, we believe it's going to and um, definitely stay with us. This requires upgrading our technology in the classrooms to be able to support this multimodal instruction. Before we can really um, do the, that and uh, provide students with this quality education in this um, space, we have to provide faculty with the necessary training. So we've developed several webinars and workshops for our faculty members on how to teach effectively online or in the uh, remote environment. And the last but not the least, um, that's looking at our campus specifically, as a result of the pandemic, it became very clear to us that you know, having a robust IT office and IT system is going to be more critical for us, for our operations going into the future than any other time. So um, we've actually um, decided that our chief technology officer can, would also play the role of chief innovation officer because this is the area in which we believe there will be a lot of uh, need for us to be innovating that's in technology as a whole in order for us to meet the different uh, teaching modalities that are on the horizon. So in conclusion, um, I would say um, the most important thing that we are currently facing in the higher education landscape is uncertainty. 61% of universities have already decided that they will be face-to-face, -face, um, that's instruction on campus. 20% are going hybrid, and this is nationally, as we are. And 18% are currently trying to figure out what they will do. It shows the level of uncertainty in the system, but we are also preparing, as we prepare for the hybrid system, and that's a hybrid modality, should there be you know, a, a situation where we have to flip back to fully online, we will be ready to do that. So that is built into a hybrid preparation um, uh, for the fall. So I would end here and um, take questions um, at the appropriate time. Thank you.
All right, thank you. Now, Dr. Altman? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. It's always a pleasure to work with my friend and uh, comrade, Daniel, from just up the road in Millersville. We like to keep Franklin and Marshall in Millersville in close contact with each other. And I will say that um, about 80% of what Daniel said is also true for us. So you will hear some repetition for sure. I am going to share my screen now. Okay, here we are. So, um, as I said, much of what Daniel said is applicable to Franklin and Marshall too. And uh, you will have seen that as other schools present their plans, um, there are many commonalities. Let me just figure out how to advance. Here we are. Okay. So you're seeing our statue of John Marshall wearing a mask, which is um, emblematic. We've been using this photograph uh, just to demonstrate the importance of masking and, uh, and to, uh, to inject a little levity into some of our graphics. But much as Millersville had to pivot on a dime in March when the pandemic became a reality for us locally, we did the same. We had no fully online classes at that time. And so in the space of um, three weeks, we put our 550 uh, spring classes online. And that was done with a great huge push and a great deal of faculty training. So we closed the campus essentially as of uh, spring break, extended spring break by a week to give everyone a little more time to get settled back at home or elsewhere and to give our faculty another week to get prepared. And then we, like Millersville, had a significant contingent of, uh, of students who remained residential. We had 240 students with us on campus in the residence halls until the end of the spring semester. Many of those were international students who either couldn't uh, go home or who had significant challenges to travel. So that was a big part of that population. We immediately transitioned to having everyone who could work off-site working off-site, that is off campus. We still needed to have some of our professional staff working here to support the needs of those students who were still in residence. But we quickly had almost, well, by far the greatest percentage of, uh, of all faculty and all staff working from at home or from elsewhere. What was the response? Well, I'm very happy to say that the faculty rose to the occasion immediately. We are a campus that really prides ourselves on excellence of teaching. And so this was, um, this was both a necessity and an interesting challenge for our faculty. And they very quickly learned a lot of technological delivery modes that they hadn't known before. So the faculty response was terrific and continues to be terrific. We did make sure though that we surveyed the students after the end of the spring semester to see what their reaction was to having gone to all online. And we discovered a couple of things. First of all, that they far preferred in-person instruction to online. And that second, doing the standard four courses at the same time sim simultaneously online was a really, really hard lift for them. So we realized that we wanted to make some differences for the spring that I will get to immediately. So uh, in the, in the, so for the fall, the, the first priority, Dr. Mm -hmm. Altman, um, I, we just received a note from someone in our chat that they can't see your uh, your, your screen. Um, oh, okay. So let me see. Um, if, if if you all could respond in the chat and let me know if uh, you're also experiencing these difficulties, uh, that would be great. Um, Jonathan, my my screen says you are screen sharing. Okay. Um, okay, we are. Uh, some folks are saying they can see them uh, for the the folks who are having troubles maybe um, okay thank you for letting me know uh, I think we're good to go here if you're having trouble maybe re try to resize your own screen uh, and then we can continue um, so thanks thanks Dr. Altman for, uh, sorry for interrupting I just wanted to make sure we were okay here so perfect go ahead I hope that everyone can see it now thank you for letting me know that there was an issue so for plans for the fall, I'm going to go back one slide. 
Let's start there. So as it is for Millersville and for everywhere else, our health protocols have to be the first priority. There is no negotiation there. So health and safety of our students, health and safety of our employees, and health and safety of the surrounding community are what has to come first. We are planning to test all students upon arrival. We have more students from out of state and from further afield than other institutions do locally. And we also have more than 20% of our student population who are international. And so we plan to test everyone and we are still working out exactly how we're going to do that. More than likely we are going to have to use a third party provider because uh, LGH Penn Medicine is not going to have the capacity to do that. As for delivery of the academic program, what, um, what Dr. Ruba was calling a multimodal approach is I think the same as what we are calling a hybrid approach to the delivery of the academic curriculum. For us, what that means is that every single course that we are going to be offering for both the fall and next spring can be taught or can be taken either exclusively online or with in-person components. That means that every course will have some synchronous elements, meaning that all students and the professor will have to be online at the same time or in person together. Uh, but all courses will also have a piece that is exclusively online. And for us, that will be mostly the delivery of information. So content delivery will be online and then collaborative and um, and integrative and face-to-face -face and mentoring activities will happen in a separate digital space for courses that are only online and will happen in a carefully structured and de-densified way in person for those courses that do have an in-person component. Our principles in planning all of this are flexibility, responsiveness so that we can shift as we go if something needs to change. And that has to do with the ability to shut down campus very quickly again, if needed to because of circumstances that are outside of our control or because something has shifted on our campus and we're no longer comfortable having anyone on campus. So responsiveness and flexibility are very important. Equity is a very large consideration for us. A very sizable piece of our student population will be better served if they are on campus than if they are at home because of the conditions they are working on or under, especially for online courses. These are questions of time zone, of ability of hardware, of accessibility of hardware and software, of other family responsibilities, for example, that they are juggling if they're also living at home. So accessibility of resources and equity of resources is something that's very important to us. We also are very concerned about the quality of education. We learned what didn't work in the spring with our move to online. And so we have been training intensively. Our faculty have been, all of them have been in a series of workshops uh, all summer since the end of the, the spring semester. We've been working with other schools and course designers from programs that have a, uh, a larger online component than we traditionally do. So there's a lot of training going on this summer and all faculty are adapting all of their courses for a particular audience at a particular time. So highly individualized education. We're also known for our high impact pedagogy and that means learning how to use all of the components of what's available online to the maximum of their, uh, of their ability, of their capacity, but also to figure out how those in real time pieces are going to work so that we're always building community and retaining that um, highly intensive mentoring quality that is one of the hallmarks of our instruction. We also broke the year into modules. We are generally on two semesters, a fall semester and a spring semester. Instead of doing that this year, we are doing two seven-week modules in the fall with no fall break in between because we want to discourage travel off campus. All of our students, like the Millersville students, will finish their classes here on the 20th of November before the Thanksgiving break. We will begin August 26th. We will finish classes November 20th without a break. 
final exams for the fall will be taken online and then we will be entirely closed for December and January to correspond with the, the traditional flu season and what we, we might see as a second round of COVID-19 spiking. We will do for the first time in about four decades, we will do a January term or a J term. That is exclusively online as well. It will be in fact for the month of January and that will allow our students wherever they land for that two month break to do an additional course, which gives them a chance to catch up if they, if they are one course short, to get ahead by a course, or in fact to try a course in a discipline that they might not otherwise have done because they'll only be taking one course for that month long period. We're including that possibility with the tuition for our year so there's no additional charge for the J term but it essentially gives students a chance to do an extra course without any additional charge. As for residential living, we will, uh, we're working very closely with our students now figuring out who actually wants to come to campus under these conditions. And that's one of the things that we are doing, which is to make very clear to students and their families that they have to make a choice. If they come back to campus for residential instruction and to live together, they have to accept the conditions and the constraints under which we will all be working. So we will have a social compact that we are developing in conjunction with the student government and everyone on campus, employees and students will be required to agree to the social compact and then we will do continuous education. We can't get complacent, we can't slack off once everyone comes. So we will make sure that we are very clear and we've been very clear about the wearing of masks, about um, hand cleansing, about physical distancing, and about uh, the testing. So students actually have a choice. If they don't want to live under those conditions, they can choose to take their classes online from elsewhere. That will help us de-densify our residence halls a little bit, but we're also being very clear that those same health conditions and protocols apply to all the students who live in the surrounding area around the college campus as well. For admissions and enrollment considerations, our numbers uh, and our percentages are not far off what Millersville is seeing. We're down in our incoming class, in our number of deposits for the incoming class, by mm, somewhere around 2%. And uh, the melt, what Daniel called the melt, meaning the number of students who agree who deposit to come to the school but then change their minds that is actually quite slow i believe we've had a total of 11 students from the new class asked to defer for the until the following year and though, of course we agree with those deferrals it gives us a head start for the following year and those students know where they will land the following year but we're seeing very strong numbers for retention we expect that the the students coming back for their second third and fourth years will be really strong from everything we've seen including registration for fall courses a few well probably six months ago to uh, sorry six weeks ago two months ago there was there were statistics in the higher ed press that said that many students or many institutions could expect about a 20% drop off in enrollments for the fall. We are not there and neither is Miller's, Millersville and we're not seeing that, that amount of a drop off in schools like us either in residential liberal arts colleges. I think it will be a consideration. We'll have to see what the, the rising high school seniors are thinking about for fall 21. That will be another interesting set of numbers. So we, I think we'll have strong enrollment this year, but then how long the pandemic drags on and asking for much more need-based financial aid. We do only need-based financial aid, no merit aid. So our financial aid budget has increased very significantly. And that need for aid will follow those students through for the full four years. So that is another very considerable expense for us. Because of our out-of-state and international students, of which we have a great many, um, we really are going to insist on very strict testing and quarantine measures when students arrive on campus. We're also staggering the arrival of students on campus into the residence halls, just as we staggered their exit in May and June. Many of our international students are experiencing visa and travel difficulties. There are simply no available flights 
flights are outrageously expensive from some destinations back to the United States. So we're actually doing a lot of um, creative thinking and new arrangements to accommodate our significant international population. With a third party uh, study abroad provider, we have created a program in Shanghai, China for uh, 65 of our Chinese nationals in the new class. So 65 of them will be in class taking courses with f and professors in Shanghai. We are working with a second study abroad provider in Shanghai to accommodate another 17 to 20 of those students. We are making arrangements for approximately 15 more to work as a cohort in Beijing. And we are also opening the campus we own in Bath, England to receive international students from other points of origin. So our program in Bath will not be holding their usual fall program. Instead, they are going to open for other international students who can make it to England, but might not be able to make it to the United States. And there they will also be taught remotely by Franklin and Marshall faculty. So long-term implication? Well, there is, of course, the unpredictable notion of whether uh, students will be more hesitant to enroll. The, those students who are going into their senior year of high school, we don't yet know what to predict from them. The financial consequences as Daniel said, are very, very dire. And schools who were in a precarious financial position before this happened will really struggle. This is going to tip some institutions over the edge. And I believe we will see an increased rate of closure, especially among smaller schools or schools that are uh, not well endowed or schools that don't benefit from their state funding. There are... Um, there are many strategic decisions that we are making to hasten our own recovery from this. One of the things we have done is we have not laid off any of our staff. We furloughed a small number of staff for the summer months when there was no work for them to do because we had no students in residence. We will start bringing those people back to work. And of course, by definition, a furlough means that they kept their health benefits from us. We also furloughed them when there were enhanced um, federal unemployment benefits available. So we feel that they were probably made whole. But we haven't laid anybody off because we know we will need all those people. And in fact, we will uh, add some strategic positions, just as Daniel mentioned, for um, innovation in the technology space. We have Probably uh, we're going to add a COVID-19 coordinator to run all of this for the campus for the year to be the point person to keep all of the various initiative working, initiatives working together. We also had already planned to hire our inaugural chief diversity officer. I'm very glad to say that we have hired that person. She will be joining us at the end of August. And in this year of great disruption and social action against racism, that will be a very important person to help us coordinate all of those various initiatives on campus as well. We also anticipate that we need to engage some more housing assistance. That is to say, in this case, probably graduate students, and we hope very much to hire graduate students from Millersville, in fact, so that we can provide housing for them, but also have an adult presence among students to help them through all of the anxiety and the changes to what used to be the, the normal routine. And then, of course, there are all of the larger national discussions about the value of post-secondary education. There are some paradoxes and some contradictions in that conversation. Some students and their families are, are questioning again and asking, interrogating whether it's worth going to school for four years and what kind of training they want to take. Some may choose to go on a more vocational track, but there is also, of course, a paradoxical but very strong discussion going on about the importance of residential undergraduate education because students have missed it so much. We've now had half a term where students saw the difference between what it was like to be in residence and to have that high touch, high mentoring approach versus studying at a distance. So there are, are many strains of thought on what the value of post-secondary education is and what it will look like in the future. On athletics, 
We belong to the Centennial Conference. We're a D3 school. There are, of course, um, lots of pragmatic questions here. We cannot allow our athletes to do anything that our students are not doing in the classroom as well. So this is different for different sports. One can imagine that track and field might be able to continue. One could imagine tennis could continue possibly swimming, um, possibly golf, but we will more than likely announce by Tuesday that the football season is off for the fall. We do not see how you can play football safely. There is a possibility for a spring football season, but there will be a joint statement from the presidents in the Centennial Conference next week, Tuesday, and then coaches will figure out how to continue their train training for their athletes in the ways that observe all of the CDC and the Pennsylvania guidelines for distancing and safe practices. Consequences for enrollment are really significant at some schools. Some schools depend very heavily on the students who come to play sports. And if they're not having a fall season, they may lose a lot of students who choose to take a year off or who choose to defer their arrival until a year when the full sports season can go forward. Future of online education, very briefly, and more, no, ma, ha, excuse me, now more than ever, we are figuring out what online education does well and what it can't do as well. What it does really well is deliver content. So that is easy to do. You can do it any time of day or night. If that content is online, you can do it when it's convenient to you, for you. You can do it at your own pace. What it does much less well, unless it is done to the optimal um, capacity of all of the tools involved is building that mentoring and collaboration, that high-touch community-based um, all virtual, if necessary, face-to-face -face communication that teaches all of the soft skills that some of you have heard me talk about before, and that actually allows students to go well beyond the content material and develop analytical skills, presentation skills, and to learn to work in a group that has diversity of thought and diversity of training and of approach. So that is what we need to turn our online courses into, courses that allow for those high impact practices. Very quickly to finish up, I will say that this is um, very much a, a, a moment to make strategic decisions and to break the mold. As Daniel said too, I am a firm believer that there is a huge silver lining in all of this, which is we are no longer complacent. We no longer can adhere to the status quo. That has been seriously disrupted. And the really positive part of this is that we have developed a whole new way of teaching and a whole new way of learning. It has also given us great flexibility. As happened elsewhere, we have had, for the first time ever, a very robust summer program. More than four times last year's numbers registered for the first session of summer school, and the numbers look equivalent for the second session of summer school. We put many more courses available for the summer, and they are some of the gateway courses that are the hardest to get during the year, so students can make really significant progress. That leaves us with the possibility of doing a really robust summer school every year, and in fact, with a J term, if we keep it, to allowing students to finish a four-year undergraduate degree in three and a half or in three years, which will represent a very significant savings for them and allow us to address some of the financial issues of the cost of private higher ed, especially in the middle class that does not get uh, very much need-based financial aid. So that is really where I will stop, I believe. Um, I want to say that for us, this, this, will come, this will come with many positive developments. It has caused us to shake ourselves out of what is tried and true and to get much more innovative. So even curricular programming, such as the beginning of an entrepreneurial program this summer and the beginning of a data analytics program, uh, those two are underway for this summer and we plan to continue to innovate in a curricular fashion to be responsive to student needs. I'll stop there. Thank you, Jonathan. All right, thank you. And uh, stop sharing the screen there, perfect. Way to go. Thank you for that presentation. Both of you um, really gave us a, a really in-depth analysis of where you are now and where you see yourself in the future, which is really encouraging to hear some of the positive 
um, positive steps you're taking to, to meet this opportunity of change. So fantastic. Um, for those of you uh, who'd like to ask a question, please uh, go to the Q&A function down below while I'm talking here um, and submit a question uh, to Dr. Wuba and Dr. Altman. Um, it can be to both of them or one of them. Um, but while uh, we're waiting for folks to submit a question, um, I've got uh, one myself for Dr. Wuba. Um, as a, a graduate of Westchester University, part of the PASHE system, um, I've been following closely the developments in the, the PASHE schools with uh, the ability to uh, do some uh, back, uh, back office um, consolidation. Uh, what are your take on, on that news that's happening and how do you think that'll affect Millersville? Um, well, thank you, Jonathan, for that question. Um, what is currently going on in Pashi is what we call the system redesign. And the system redesign is basically an effort to enhance the operations of each of our universities to be able to serve our students. So currently we have 14 universities and because of the locations of some of our universities and the big decline that we've seen in enrollment that's across the state, some of our institutions are not faring well. So um, our new chancellor who came in uh, 18 months ago has been working uh, with all the 14 universities to find ways by which we can cut costs you know, through, uh, let's say, sharing uh, back office that, uh, services, as you just mentioned. But also we are looking at our faculty to student ratio, you know, as well as non-faculty to student ratio. For example, if you look at um, the numbers that we have now in terms of faculty to student ratio, they are, um, they've really Dr. Wuba, I think you froze there. Oh no. Well, while we wait for uh, Dr. Wuba to get back um, with us here, uh, I'll ask Dr. Altman uh, a question um, from Robert Smith. It says, seems like FNM is devoting a lot of effort to redesign currently, uh, current courses using instructional design techniques specific to online delivery to foster engagement and high impact. Besides being a good and right thing to do, is it if this redesign is not done, would accreditation be at risk? That's, a, that's an excellent question. Thank you. So our accreditors, we are accredited by, accredited by the Middle States um, Commission on Higher Education. And that as, in, as many commissions have done, they are giving great flexibility this year to, for this past spring and also for the coming academic year to schools to make the necessary accommodations. But your question actually pertains to what we're going to need to do for accountability with the commission in this coming year. Our uh, institutional research arm will make sure that we coordinate with the Middle States folks and our liaison there. So far, we're in great compliance and they have no issue with it. But I think the real key will be what we intend to do once we're past the crisis and how our regular delivery will be formulated after the COVID crisis is over. At that point, we need to decide what part of our curriculum, if any, is going to be regularly online. My guess is that we will go back to a very small proportion of, of online courses exclusively, but our faculty will have learned how to use the online component to do the equivalent of a flipped classroom, which is that content delivery could be acquired by students at any time, day, night, weekend, weekday, on their own. And then the in-person component can be even more powerful and intensive on the collaborative and analytical pieces of our curriculum. So my guess is we will move into a, an area where more courses will have an online component, but that the emphasis will still be on in-person high impact teaching. And all of that is something that we will have to provide in a brief to the commission. Thank you for that, that response and thanks for that question, Robert. Um, I have uh, just a little bit of time probably for a quick response here. Um, might there be additional opportunities for FNM and Millersville to partner moving forward? That question is from Mara Umble. <laughs> yes, indeed, Mara Umble, an alumna 
of um, Franklin and Marshall, there are many opportunities for Millersville and Franklin and Marshall to collaborate. And we already do quite a lot of that. But yes, indeed, I think this is a moment where we don't want to have competing programs. We want to have programs that we can make accessible to each other. In some ways, we already share social opportunities with fraternities and sororities shared between the two institutions. We will hope to, as I mentioned, to employ some graduate students as, uh, as help with residential or housing assistance. And programmatically, we already send some of our students to Millersville for some computing science courses. We hope to be able to be reciprocal and to have Millersville students take courses with us as well. So that loosening up is very important. And Daniel and I have been working very closely together since the minute we both arrived, which is almost exactly two years ago. Excellent. That, that's, that's good news to hear. Well, I, I just want to thank you for joining us, Dr. Altman, and thanks to Dr. Wuba uh, for joining us as well. Um, really informative um, presentations from both of you today, and uh, we appreciate the uh, work you do in the Lancaster community. So thank you so much for being here. Jonathan, you were very kind to invite us. I'm a big, big fan of Hourglass, and I would love to join you again anytime. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and before we say goodbye, I have a couple announcements here. Um, next First Friday Forum will be August 7th, um, and we will have a top, the topic will be technology in Lancaster County. We're, we're having a panel, um, and our panelist, uh, our moderator for the panel will be Charlie Reisinger, uh, the technology director for Penn Manor School District. So uh, we look very, uh, very much looking forward to that. Um, also, next Friday, July 10, um, we are hoping to have the Hourglass website live. So uh, we have a new website coming um, and have been able to work on that. So uh, at some point, uh, hopefully July 10, it will be live, but you know how those things go. Once you announce it, then it takes an, <laughs> a little extra time to get out. So well, we're hoping July 10 for that. Uh, so be on the lookout. Um, we appreciate you all joining us today and have a wonderful, oh, Dr. Wuba is back. Before, maybe he'll he'll join us here a little bit. There we can see him. <laughs> Sorry, my Wi-Fi went off. Uh, no, no worries. <laughs> well, thank. I, I was saying thank you so much for joining us, um, and thanks to our audience for being here as well today. We appreciate it, and have a wonderful, wonderful Fourth of July holiday. Um, and uh, hopefully, we'll see you uh, next time. So, thank you. Thank you all. Thank Dan, you. Great to see you. I'm always happy to present with you, my friend. Same here, Barbara. Thank you very much. All right. Take Thank care. you, Jonathan. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks.